Okay, so just to kind of summarize some of that and get everyone up to speed if they're new to this topic, I think most people, George, are aware of the negative effects of animal agriculture on the environment. But when it comes to beef, I think many people have been sold this idea that the problem is not beef, it's how the beef is produced. And that if we move away from intensive animal agriculture, we all have this idea in our head of what that looks like. Um, it's very inhumane practice, lots of cows packed into a small area, a lot of monocrops required to grow uh, feed to feed those animals that contributes to to deforestation. Uh, but what Alan Savory has put forward is a kind of special form of producing beef that we no longer have to kind of feel bad about. We don't have to feel like we're eating this product that's destroying the environment. And the message really, which Kiss the Ground or Sacred Cow or Alan Savory or or wherever you kind of look within that community is that it's not the cow, George. It is the how. And so I think we need to to unpack why this special form of grazing that's being put forward why your position is that it's not scientific and that this claim that holistic grazing is essential to mitigating climate change is not evidence-based. And I like the way in the debate you, you kind of framed this with three criteria, I believe it was, that, that you said if we're going to accept this position of Alan Savory's and the regenerative kind of grazing community at large, then these three criteria need to be met. So maybe we could walk through some of that. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, in, in order to support this claim that um, livestock grazing could mitigate climate change, let alone is essential to it, which was the motion of the debate which Alan proposed, you would have to meet the following three conditions, as you say. The first is that carbon must be stored in the soil, not, not just cycled through it, because you know we know that in aerated soils, agricultural soils, carbon goes in, but it also goes out um, um, pretty fast often. So it actually needs to be stored in the soil. And you would need to show, meeting proper tests of statistical significance, that that storage is sustained across meaningful time periods. Uh, and, and that storage must be what we call additional, in other words, it wouldn't be happening anyway, verifiable, you must be able to demonstrate that that's really happening, and attributable to the presence of livestock. In other words, you had to show that it is the cows which are responsible for that storage. So that's criterion one. Um, it, it, it has to be, be um, demonstrable, additional, verifiable, attributable. Criterion two, is that any carbon storage that you achieve through your um, special ranching technique has to outweigh the current account emissions of the livestock operation. And by current account emissions, that's the sort of daily emissions which are produced uh, by your animals and by your um, um, commercial operations surrounding those animals. So that would include enteric methane, in other words, the methane produced in cow's stomachs, which is um, um, the, the, uh, the uh, um, livestock are, are the world's foremost source of anthropogenic methane, very powerful greenhouse gas. Nitrous oxide, which um, comes particularly from livestock dung, another powerful greenhouse gas. And the carbon dioxide that is produced by your machinery, your feed, your transport, your slaughter, your packing. In other words, any carbon you're storing in the soil as well as being demonstrable, attributable, verifiable, etc., has to outweigh any greenhouse gases that you're producing by producing this beef. So that was criterion two. And then the third one is that any carbon storage in the soil also has to weigh what I call the capital account greenhouse losses. And by that, I mean the carbon opportunity costs of not having a wild ecosystem, including wild herbivores, that would otherwise have occupied the same land. And actually, carbon opportunity cost is a huge impact, particularly of extensive 
livestock keeping. And, and you're quite right. We all hate, and rightly so, intensive livestock operations. They're horrible. They're destructive. They're polluting. They're extremely cruel to the animals. The great majority of our um, livestock products, incidentally, meat and milk and the rest, come from those operations, um, though we like to deny that. And and a lot of people say, well, the answer then is extensive livestock. But the problem with extensive livestock is it requires a huge amount of land. And that land um, has got an ecological opportunity cost and a carbon opportunity cost. And the opportunity cost is the cost of what you could otherwise be doing if you weren't using it for for purpose X. So in other words, if you're not using it for cattle ranching, that land could be supporting rainforest, for instance, or a rich wild savanna ecosystem or a natural grassland ecosystem, all of which turn out to be much richer in carbon than, um, than the great majority of cattle ranching, and in fact, probably than any cattle ranching. So you would have to demonstrate that you're also outweighing through any carbon sequestration in the soil or carbon storage in the soil, the capital account greenhouse gas losses. In other words, those carbon opportunity costs not having the wild ecosystem. Um, and then you subtract from that because we've got to be rigorous and fair in all this. Um, the carbon costs of producing protein by alternative means. So you can compare, you can say, you know, you could get your, uh, you could be eating beef and you've got um, X kilograms of protein being produced by your beef operation. This is a carbon opportunity cost of that. But we've also got to look at the carbon opportunity cost of the protein we might otherwise be eating. Um, and so you subtract that from that. And this net carbon opportunity cost should consist of a combination of below ground carbon and above ground carbon. And both of those should be accounted. So those were the criteria. I think they are rigorous and fair criteria. I haven't heard anyone um, come up with a clear critique of what's wrong with those criteria. Um, um, people seem to accept that those are, are basically what we should be looking for if we are to establish that Alan Savory's claims could be true. And so I use those, uh, made an exhaustive search looking at those criteria right across the scientific literature. And there is not a single paper anywhere which shows those criteria being met. There is nowhere on earth which has been documented in the scientific literature which ticks those boxes. So Alan's claims simply have no empirical basis. Quick one, folks. I get asked all the time about buying supplements and getting blood tests. The good news is I've created comprehensive and completely free guides for both. Simply head over to my website, theproof.com, to download them. That's theproof.com. Okay, let's get back to the episode. Where do the studies that Alan Savory and, and people within this holistic grazing community typically fall down? Just listening to those three criteria, you know, I'm my mind's kind of going to nutrition research, at least with the carbon opportunity cost, because the carbon opportunity cost gets me thinking about the importance of what you're comparing to. And in in nutrition, we can we can almost make anything look good if we if we choose the right comparator. Um, so is it that in these studies that Alan Savory and his colleagues are referring to that they're they're not comparing it to, you know, all of the possible ways that that land could be used? Is it that they're not you know, properly calculating the amount of carbon that is actually stored versus sequestered? Where, where are these studies falling down with regards to the three criteria here that you've set? Yeah, so they actually fall down on all three of, of those criteria. Um, so um, for a start, they um, ha have these extremely optimistic projections about storing carbon in, in the soil. Um, and, and if you listen to the way they talk about it you would think you could just store carbon indefinitely in in the soil but actually there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that in um, aerated soils in other words agricultural soils we're talking about soils which aren't waterlogged um so you know to distinguish it from um, peat bogs for example or um from salt marshes um where you can get an accumulation of carbon you just don't have a sustained accumulation of carbon in aerated soils. They they saturate and saturate pretty quickly. 
and then they lose as much carbon as 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 they might sequester so you've got this cycling process where carbon goes in and goes out but there's not long-term storage in fact to demonstrate long-term storage in in the soil um you, you'd have to do that across uh what you know in any other carbon um situation are, are thought of as meaningful time periods and that's at least 20 or 30 years and 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 it's simply not being done. In fact, even the tools we've got to demonstrate that storage just aren't adequate. So, for instance, loss and ignition, which is the main way of, of showing what the carbon content of soil is, is just not accurate enough to show the kind of incremental additions which people are claiming. So that, that we don't even have the right tools to demonstrate that this thing is, is supposedly happening. Um, and and then um, you, because of in, enormous degree of patchiness of variability within one field, you can have a high carbon spike in one place, and you can have almost no carbon in another place. Um, you, you 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 have to do a massive amount of sampling, um, and you have to be sure that your sampling is absolutely pinpoint accurate, so that you're looking at exactly the same place. Um, from one year to the next and and we we simply are not up to b being able to do this not on any of the sort of large scale sites which are which which we would need in order to show that this is happening so so right from the outset um the claims that you're storing carbon in the soil simply can't be validated and moreover the the storage capacity of the soil is is limited, as the great soil scientist Ratan Lal has pointed out, by um, by by what that soil would have been like without any human interference. So, if you've got a grassland soil, there is a certain amount of carbon that, that soil can can hold, and the maximum amount is the amount it held before we started messing with that ecosystem. It, it woodland soil similarly and and and, um, and 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 all the rest of it. So even if you were to um somehow miraculously restore all the world's grassland soils back to what they once were, because they've got a finite capacity, you wouldn't get anywhere near the amount of industrial emissions uh, which Alan Savory says he can cancel out, which is all the emissions ever ever produced since the Industrial Revolution. So, in other words, it's it's to use um, the the rigorous scientific term, it's total bullshit. Wouldn't that soil saturation also? And I'm playing devil's advocate here, but it, say you were to take a, a, some grasslands that were currently being used for for grazing, and you, we restored that system through rewilding to a natural ecosystem that that land would also still reach a, a point of carbon saturation right are you saying that the the issue is here with when you have animals grazing on that over that land over time if you're storing less and less carbon and then you reach a point of saturation the net emissions become greater because those animals are still emitting greenhouse gas emissions. Is is that the is that the problem here? Well, well, no, no, that's the second problem. So, so the first problem is that actually you can't store much carbon in the soil, um, and and uh, even um, and and also that sequestration, in other words, cycling through the soil, is not the same as carbon storage. You know, carbon storage is something you must demonstrate for any useful purposes across 20 or 30 years. And 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 people are simply not demonstrating that. And in fact, they're being paid carbon credits long before we've reached any sort of time period. So it, it's effectively fraudulent. Um and um uh, and so so the I the, the because um it's very hard to demonstrate that you're storing carbon and that saturation is achieved pretty quickly. You've got, there's a very small pool that you can use um, to counteract any of your um, process emissions, your current account emissions, or your capital account emissions. So then we get on to problem two, which is that day to day, you're still producing all these greenhouse gas emissions, which are counteracting any amount of of carbon that you're storing in the soil, which is generally a very small amount if you're storing it at all, 
Um, and yes, as you rightly say, th those emissions are still being produced. The, the cows are still emitting methane. The dung is still emitting nitrous oxide. The machinery is still emitting carbon dioxide. Um, and it's it's there was a, um, a, a meta-analysis looking at 300 papers around the world which showed that there is no recorded instance anywhere of a cattle operation or a livestock grazing operation washing its own face in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the, the, the best they ever found in any documented paper was um, um, uh, uh, counteracting 60% of those emissions. And even that is making some pretty heroic assumptions about um, soil carbon storage. And then that's before you get onto the opportunity costs. So what you're saying there is in the best case scenario, if this these uh, holistic grazing systems are sequestering slash storing carbon, which I want to come back to and, and double click on a little more, that because the system is also producing emissions, when you when you look at the net carbon emissions, only 60 60 percent of the emissions coming from the practice are being offset by what is potentially stored. But over time, that, that storage capacity is limited. So as time goes on and on and on, your land is less able to store carbon is what I'm hearing, but your practice above the ground still has the same emissions. So the amount of offset is getting smaller and smaller over time if, I'm, right. if I'm hearing this yeah. and correctly. It, and it rapidly declines to zero, yeah. Yep. Yeah.